breaking news concerning the U.S. economy. Official figures show that more than one in five of the Right now is a time um, where leadership is extremely important in our world. And I want to look at a leader that helped launch the church. Uh, he was a disciple of Jesus, and his name is Peter. And we're going to be looking at Peter's spiritual journey, um, his, the inward journey and the outward journey um, that Jesus took Peter to, through to become the leader that he became. So we're going to look at uh, seven snapshots of this journey. Snapshot number one, come follow me, said Jesus to Peter and his brother, Andrew, as they were fishing. They were fishermen. Um, they were uh, living in and around the Sea of Galilee. They were Jewish. And um, we know that, that uh, because they were fishing, that was their trade. That was probably their family trade. And we also know that uh, Peter wasn't chosen to be a disciple or a learner for another rabbi. Um, and so to have someone like Jesus come and say, follow me and my teachings, my way, my truths, and, and learn from me was a big deal. And so Peter began following the rabbi, the teacher, Jesus. Snapshot number two. But who do you say I am? And Jesus had been talking with his disciples and he's, he had said, well, who do other people say that I am? And some people say you're this, some people say you're that. And then he looked at his disciples, he said, who do you think I am? The thing I love about Peter is he's this, uh, he's the kind of guy, like, even if he doesn't know, he's going to have a go. Like, he'll, he'll just blurt things out. He'll just run for things. And, um, and Peter says, you, he answers when everyone else is afraid. Peter says, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ, the chosen one. And, and Jesus says, you're, you're exactly right. And this has been revealed to you by my heavenly father. And in this moment of brilliance, this major step forward for Peter, um, in his development with Jesus, Jesus says, you know, and I'm going to call you Peter. That's my nickname for you. And it means rock or rocky. And he says, on, on this rock, I will build my church on this leader and his leadership. I'm going to build my church. But Peter's like this impulsive guy. And so in the next scene in, um, this story, Jesus begins to tell them, his disciples, he says, but you need to know that I'm, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed um, unjustly, but I'm going to be killed. And Peter, it says, uh, took Jesus aside and it began to reprimand Jesus, reprimand his rabbi, uh, which usually doesn't go su super well. And he said to Jesus, heaven forbid it, Lord, this will never happen to you. You'll never have to go through crucifixion. I'll, I won't let that happen. And Jesus' response was this, get away from me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's point of view. Within a few verses, Peter goes from like getting the right answer, blurting out the right answer, and, and to, to going to fully getting it wrong where Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. What did Jesus mean by that? Well, Peter was tempting Jesus to take a shortcut to becoming the king of God's kingdom. And it's the same temptation that Satan had tempted Jesus with uh, in, the, in the beginning of the story in the book of Matthew. And I love that in this, this uh, snapshot number two, we see um, Peter taking a step forward, but he also takes a step back. And I think many of us can relate to Peter um, where... You know, sometimes we'll do things or say things and, and, um, and maybe even think things that we haven't thought through that maybe aren't best and, and we might take steps back in our life. We've got a family member, uh, one time we had someone in the hospital and we're all trying to help and figure ways of helping and, uh, the relative jumped up and said, I'll help and then ran off except there were stairs and flew down the stairs and into a wall and, and then we had two people in the hospital <laughs> that we were trying to help. And sometimes we, we don't look before we leap, but that's why I love the story of Peter. Um, snapshot number three. 
why are you talking to her? In this uh, snapshot, the disciples uh, have gone into a village to get food for Jesus, and Jesus is having a conversation while they're gone with a Samaritan woman. And in, back in these days, in that culture, um, Jews never talked with Samaritans. They were seen as the enemy. Uh, there was a racial uh, hatred between those two groups of people. And um, in Jesus' culture, the uh, rabbis and religious leaders had a prayer. Uh, it's a famous prayer. Uh, and it went something like this, Lord, thank you for not making me a Gentile, which is a, a, anybody who's not Jewish. Lord, thank you for making me uh, not a Gentile, a dog, or a woman. And Jesus was talking to someone who, who fit two of those, um, two of the three of that profile of that prayer. He's talking with a Samaritan hated enemy of the Jews at the time, and she was a woman. And when Jesus is having the spiritual conversation, Jesus is breaking through those racial and gender barriers. In the middle of it, the disciples come up and it says all of them thought, why is he talking to her? What is he doing with that woman? And in this story, we see the disciples, including Peter, um, have cultural blind spots. They have cultural chauvinism, uh, cultural ethnic, um, ethnocentrism and, and racism even. And um, it's really important to highlight this because from the time G Peter met Jesus up to this snapshot in his spiritual journey, um, a lot of their religious identity and Peter's religious identity was um, wrapped up in racial and ethnic identity. And Jesus is helping move them forward. Uh, let's move to snapshot number four. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Now, in this moment, Jesus um, has gathered his disciples. It's a special moment. He's about to go to the cross. Uh, he's been with his disciples for a long time, and, and Jesus is wanting to teach them something very significant. Jesus um, begins to wash his disciples' feet. Now, that's kind of weird to maybe you and me, like that's just kind of a strange thing if someone were to do that. But in that culture, you always had someone wash your feet and it was never the leader who would wash your feet. It was like something that a servant would do, something that uh, someone from the lower class would do for someone from the higher class. And so Peter says, no, God, no, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. Never should you wash my feet. And, and Jesus says, you're, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but someday you will. And his re Jesus' response to Peter is, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. And then Peter says, then Lord, wash my hands, my head, wash all of me, Lord, and not just my feet. And you see Jesus saying like, whoa, whoa, calm down, Peter. I'm not going to wash all of you. All, your feet are just, the, just in need of some washing. I love that Peter, like he's a little bit extreme and, and it, when Jesus says, I, I gotta, I gotta wash your feet for you to, uh, understand this lesson. Peter's like, wash all of me. It's like my dad when, with deals. Um, my family's very frugal. Um, except if there's a good deal. I remember my dad would go to this place called Deals Only. And my mom would always be afraid because when he'd go, she'd be like, you don't need much. He's like, oh, I know. We don't need much. I'm not going to buy much. But then there'd be a deal like a year's worth of really, really cheap laundry detergent or a year's worth of, um, you know, like uh, paper towels. My dad would come back with all these towels. It's just like he couldn't help himself. And that's like Peter. He couldn't help himself. Lord, wash all of me. And Jesus like, no, no, calm down. I'm teaching you uh, the lesson of servant leadership. Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve. Snapshot number five. Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Uh, this is Peter speaking to Jesus. I'm going to be there through thick and thin. I'm going to go to prison or uh, I'm going to die for you, Jesus. And uh, in this moment of like, courage or, you know, bravado by Peter, where he's saying how committed he is, um, Jesus says to him, uh, you're going to betray me before the rooster crows. You're going to betray me three times, Peter. And you don't realize it, but you're going to betray me. You're going to walk away. You're not ready to walk uh, to prison and death with me yet. Peter says, no, I, I'll be there for you, Lord. And he tries to make the argument that I will never betray you. And then it, it, later in the story, Peter 
he's confronted by some people and they're saying, hey, aren't you with Jesus? And Jesus is being taken away to be unjustly tried by uh, the Sanhedrin. And uh, he's being taken away by the religious leaders. The uh, In that day, the courts and the trials were uh, connected to the religious leaders. And, and some people identify Peter and they say, aren't you with Jesus? And he says, I don't even know him. And he denies him three times. I don't know Jesus. I'm not with him. I don't know who you're talking about. And on the third denial, it says at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And suddenly the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even, that, that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. And this is a moment of failure on his journey. Like he, he really fails. And he, he abandons Jesus when Jesus needs him most. And Jesus knew he was going to do it. And yet he still loves him. When the, when the, Jesus was getting dragged into an unjust courtroom with unjust laws and, and with, um, religious leaders who were, um, condemning Jesus in, uh, unbiblical ways. Um, Peter wasn't there for Jesus. He abandoned him. But I love that that Jesus doesn't abandon Peter when Peter abandons him. Later in the book of, at the end of the book of John, we see Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, um, back with his disciples, cooking them breakfast. And he invites Peter in and he, he asks Peter three times, do you love me? And three times Peter says, Lord, you know I do. You know I love you. I love you, Lord. And Jesus restores Peter back as a disciple and leader, not so that Jesus had, you know, knew that Peter was a leader, but so that Peter could believe again that he was a leader and trusted uh, by Jesus. There's moments in our life where we sh- maybe realize we should have spoken up for somebody or, or some people and we kept silent. And sometimes if we don't let that define us, that can be a moment that we learn from. Or Peter ended up being, um, he ended up dying for Christ. He ended up going to prison. He ended up doing the things he originally said, but it was later on in the journey. He wasn't ready for it at one point, but, but it prepared him. His failure prepared him to speak up when it mattered, to be there for Jesus when it mattered, and to uh, be willing to go through the hardship for the kingdom of God. And some of us might be learning to find our voice and learning how to stand up right now. Snapshot number six, Peter has been slowly transforming, having transformational steps of faith. And he becomes the leader of the church. In the beginning of Acts, he launches the church and, um, and all these people begin find, you know, believing in Jesus and following Jesus. And there's miraculous healing. There's uh, the spread of the gospel. It's amazing. But there's this important transformation that occurs in Peter that begins moving him from the monocultural approach to a multicultural approach. Up until in, up until this moment in Acts chapter 10, the church has been monocultural. It's been Jewish, maybe with other languages, but it's been um, a Jewish faith. And this, this story in Acts chapter 10 is one of the most powerful transformations for Peter where Peter was becoming uh, something that was in the way of the church exploding to the rest of the world to bless the whole world. Um, God transforms him so that message of the gospel can carry forward. And here's what happened um, um, in a brief, let me tell it to you in a, in a nutshell. Um, a man named Cornelius, who was a Gentile, not Jewish, um, had a vision that he needed to seek out uh, the, the church leader, Peter. And while that, while he had his vision, Peter had a dream and a, a vision where God was challenging him to eat food in this dream that was outside of Jewish dietary law. And, and then told them that a man was, uh, that the men were coming to get him and that he was to go with them. And so when he wakes up, he, he's, he's had this disorienting dilemma. He's supposed to like eat food that he's not supposed to eat with. He's supposed to go meet with a, a Gentile, this man Cornelius. Um, who Jewish men don't go into, and they're not supposed to, it's against the rules to go into the home of a Gentile. And this disorienting 
um, dilemma happens for him. What should he do? And he realizes that God is wor- at work out in another culture and in other people in ways that he never thought. And in Acts chapter 10, here is the realization when he sees the Holy Spirit at work in Cornelius and realizes that God is at work in other peoples and other nations. He says this, Peter said, I really am learning that God doesn't show partiality. I love that language. I'm really learning that God doesn't show partiality to one group of people over another. This is one of the most powerful verses in the New Testament. This is where the church and the church leader, Peter, the rock that Jesus is building his church on, realizes that God is not a God of partiality, that his faith is not just monocultural, it's been, it's designed to be multicultural, um, it's multi-ethnic, not mono-ethnic, and, um, and he realizes, I love this, I'm learning he's learning, he's growing. When you stop learning, you stop being able to lead. When you stop learning, you stop developing and growing. And and God is always helping us grow. And I think we're in a time right now that many of us are really learning about how um, big and how great and how boundary-breaking the love of God is. Verse 35. Rather, in every nation, whoever worships him and does what is right is acceptable to him. This is the message of peace that he sent to the Israelites by proclaiming the good news through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Not, he's not just the a Jewish God. He's not just a God of whatever ethnic ethnicity of your choice or preference. God isn't partial. He wants to bless all people. And Peter realizes it. And he has this moment where he realizes his the blind spot that he'd been carrying with him, the cultural chauvinism, the cultural uh, ethnocentrism and racism. And, and he is being challenged like never before. And this Holy Spirit and the good news of the gospel just rips through the church in new ways out into the world. And this is one of the biggest conversion transformation moments in Peter's life. God is, Jesus is at work in in places even I wouldn't have thought. And I used to walk with Jesus. Jesus is showing him his blind spot, but he's also showing him a way forward, a way of, of becoming this mosaic tapestry, this beautiful reality of of all people being brought to the cross of Jesus. So Peter's been on this journey, and it's an inner journey and an outer journey that God has been using to transform him. He went from not really knowing Jesus, exploring the the way of Jesus, um, to believing and knowing who Jesus is, uh, to being blind to still to his ethnocentrism, to all of a sudden becoming a multicultural leader of a movement of God. And um, here's a few key things. Every step in our journey is a step of transformation. Every one of these snapshots that we've seen of Peter has been a major step in his journey. Um, And he's transforming every step of the way. And you need to know every step you take toward Jesus and with Jesus matters to God. Sometimes we take steps forward, sometimes back, but we want to keep moving toward Jesus. Now, we're all at different places on this journey. You're at different places uh, in your spiritual journey, in your journey with how you relate to other people and other people groups. And, and we just want to encourage you to move forward in the, in the vision and toward the, the reality that we're seeing in the New Testament, the church that Jesus died for, for all people. Snapshot number seven in Galatians ch- chapter two it says this, but when Peter came to Antioch, I, Paul, the writer of like one third of the New Testament, um, he says, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was very wrong. And this is really important. So on Peter's journey, he's, he's taking this step forward. He knows it's multicultural. He knows that God, he's declared that, that, that there's no partiality in God from people group to people group. But Paul, who at one point struggled with um, racism himself and um, a a sense of monocultural superiority, um, Paul, who's been changed, says Peter has a struggle. And in verse 12, he says this, when he, Peter, arrived, 
he ate with the Gentile believers. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. Stop there for a second. Peter was eating with the Gentiles, non-Jewish people, because he had declared God isn't partial. But when he had some leaders and some friends that um, they still held on to the, some of those uh, cultural superior, ethnicity-oriented things, um, when they were still holding on to some of that older way of thinking that was wrong, that was partial, that was holding on to the sin of partiality and racism and chauvinism, uh, Peter got scared and he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. It goes on to say, he was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision, the mark of that religious ethnic identity um, uh, for, for, for Peter. And he was afraid of criticism from them. How many of, of us have not spoken up for our faith uh, for uh, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, uh, for moments when we knew it was right. How many of us have been afraid to speak up be- because we were afraid of criticism from somebody? And um, when we follow Jesus, Jesus wasn't afraid to step forward and, and to die on a cross for you and me. He wasn't afraid of the criticism he was going to take. And you might not even be ready for this right now, but at some point in your spiritual journey with Jesus, you're going, to ha- you're going to have to be strong enough to say, you know what? I'm going to stand up. I'm going to speak out for, for the things that Jesus cares about. He spoke up for me. He spoke up for others. I'm going to speak up. And there's times where there's others who can't stand up or can't speak out, or don't have the influence, don't have the moment you have. And, and I want to encourage you to not be afraid. Verse 13, as the result... Other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. So if we don't step up, if we don't speak out, and we don't speak the truth, and we're not, I'm not saying that we should say just things that, that don't matter or that aren't important. We need, to, we need to speak out on the things that matter to Jesus, core issues. Um, we have to speak out when it comes to partiality. Like Peter says, our God isn't a God of partiality. He's not a God that lifts one race or ethnicity over another. I mean, that is, that is antithetical to the gospel. That is antithetical to the reason that Jesus went to the cross to die for the whole world. And when we remain silent, when we uh, allow others to lead in a way that is sinful, that is partial, other leaders, other people will follow that hypocrisy. And that's how families, friends, groups, Corporations, churches, states, countries, organizations, systems begin to have the sin of partiality is when people remain silent and they don't, they don't speak out and they don't stand up. Romans 12, chapter 2, Paul wrote this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. That's talking about systemic cultural beliefs that are wrong that are idolatrous, that are ugly. That's like uh, forms and beliefs and customs of racism, Um, whatever they might be, classism, um, partiality of treating this group better than this group. Um, and, And Paul goes on to say, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Friends, we have to at least be open so that we might need to change our thinking in some areas. If we think we're right about everything, if we think we know everything, we're, that's when we stop learning. We need to listen. We need to learn. Another verse that's really important um, that also emphasizes the reality of systemic sin is from 2 Corinthians. It says this, the weapons of the war we're fighting are not of this world. So it's not like weapons that we think of like tangible weapons, but we are powered by God and effective at tearing down the strongholds erected against God's truth. So this is in the realm of thought and idea and uh, our, where our, our, what our minds think about. The, um, we are demolishing arguments and ideas, every high and mighty philosophy that pits itself against the knowledge of the one true God. This is saying there are systemic cultural sins in a world that we are part of. And we are products of the communities and community we live in and we grow up in. 
And not all ideas are good. And some philosophies, some ideas, uh, like racist uh, th- philosophy and I- ideas, uh, uh, any kind of idea that, that would destroy someone made in the image of God um, for personal gain is wrong. And we have to speak the truth and we have to shine a light on that. We are taking prisoners of every thought, every emotion, and subduing them into obedience to the anointed one, Jesus. Both thoughts and emotions. Friends, we have to have self-control and we have to submit our thoughts, the way we think, uh, the way we feel. We have to submit that to the form of Jesus. Is this thought, is this way of thinking, is this way of feeling, is it um, conformed to who Jesus is? Is it making me more like Jesus or less like Jesus? We're going to be moving into a time of worship together. And after that, we're going to be taking communion. And communion is uh, a really important um, time of remembrance for Christians. We, we remember that Jesus was given as a, as a sacrifice of peace, that he brought reconciliation and peace between us and God. But not only that, but also to each other. And in this time, may you reflect on the peace that is yours with God but also on how to be a peacemaker and reconciler in our world today. I wanna encourage you in this time to, to think about what you think, to doubt some of your doubts, and to be willing to be humble and say, God, show me, reveal to me where I might have it wrong. It's time to listen.